ARC Cosumnes River College land acknowledgement. So uh, we'll just take a moment of reflection. We pause to acknowledge that Cosumnes River College sits on the occupied land that is of Miwok and Nishidam people. We remember their continued connection to this region and give thanks to our Miwok and Nishinan communities. We offer our respect to their elders and to all Miwok and Nishinan people of the past and present. We acknowledge the land acknowledgement and support the continued growth and development of our indigenous and Native American communities in South Sacramento and Elk Grove. Thank you. And Mabuhai and welcome to our Filipino American, Philippinex American History Month inaugural event with our virtual keynote presentation with Dr. Robin Magalit Rodriguez. Round of applause and woohoo, if we were here, we'd be having beverages and food. So please indulge, imbibe, or take up while you're with us this morning. We know that you're here with, from the Casamnes River College community, the Los Rios Community College District, our friends from American River College, from Folsom Lake College and Sac City College, Sacramento City College are here. We also have friends from Sacramento State, our CSU Sac State College, Sac State University, and we know there are friends up and down the West Coast, the East Coast and in between here to virtually break bread with us and support Dr. Rodriguez's work. We are so thrilled to have this inaugural Filipino American History Month event and happy Filipino American History Month to us all. We had over a hundred Friends, Kababayan, Kaibigan, Mangal Kaibigan, uh, register with us today. So thank you for joining us. And a hearty magandang umaga sa inyo lahat to all of you. Thank you so much for choosing to spend the morning with us. This morning's event would not be possible if it wasn't for the events coordination team, who you'll get to hear from a little bit this morning. Uh, our friend Paolo Soriano is a counseling faculty with Casamnes River College and also faculty at, at Sac State and um, club faculty advisor for Kasamahan Filipino, Filipinex Club. I also want to extend thanks and gratitude to my sister Sabrina Sensel, Interim Dean of Equity and Research as part of our coordination team, and Michael Bittner, who's our digital communication specialist who helped us get set up today to record and live stream if we exceed 300. Um, but we're live streaming anyway, so just to let you know, we are recording and live streaming this morning's event. And also a big thank you to our new friend, our Kai Began, Catherine Mercedes Judge, who is our, the booking coordinator for Dr. Rodriguez. Maraming maraming salamat to the event coordination team. And for all of you who helped promote and support this significant event for us today, and to acknowledge our partners at Elk Grove, Unified School District, who also uh, adopted with uh, partnership and support with Dr. Rodriguez, the first ever resolution as a school district for October as Filipino American History Month. And I'm sure we will hear more about the local communi community organizing efforts. So a few housekeeping items to share with you. As I mentioned, we are recording the event. We'll share that out for those that registered and we'll make that, that uh, link live for you. We'll also do our best to monitor the chat and thanks for engaging in the chat and for showing your screen. Please also share your video if you can. Remain muted unless you have a question towards the end, but we wanna see your beautiful, lovely faces. We wanna know you're with us. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez is seeing friends for the first time maybe that we haven't seen in a long time. So if you can, please share your video and utilize chat. We will do our best to monitor chat for questions, for comments, there will be time at about 12.15 for more Q&A, and we do have a, a prompt end at 12.30. So we appreciate within the confines of higher ed, we have an agenda, even though if we were at our homes, we would probably linger into the afternoon, a little siesta, merienda, and then stay for dinner. So here we have to limit it to 90 minutes. So without further ado, I do have a couple brief general announcements to share and then honored to introduce my esteemed colleague, Paolo Soriano, who's going to introduce Dr. Rodriguez. So for announcements, we want you to know that this is an opportunity today too, for not only us to support the important, remarkable, distinguished work of Dr. Rodriguez related to Philippine American studies and Asian AM studies, et cetera, and the community organizing work here in the greater Sacramento area. 
We're blessed to have her as a resident here in Elk Grove as well. But this is also an opportunity for us to revitalize the club Kasamahan Pilipinex. So if you're interested in helping to revitalize the student organization, please reach out to Paolo Soriano. His email will be in the chat soon. It's sorianop at crc.losrios.edu. Also, uh, we want to celebrate and highlight that we just got awarded our first individual Anna PC grant. So we are a minority serving institution. We've already been a Hispanic serving institution designation. We are an Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander designated institution. And we got both grants this last year. We have an HSI grant celebrating Mikasa who are here on the call with us in solidarity. Mikasa leadership is here. And now we have an inaugural individual grant to support up to 300 Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander students recruiting and retaining to complete CRC and, and go on and transfer. And we became part of a collaborative grant with the entire Los Rios district and Sac State and two other districts neighboring us, San Joaquin, Delta and Sierra district. So we are a regional collaborative and are going to support at CRC and across the district, each of us 25 students to support a pipeline to transfer to Sac State. So we are so thrilled about the capacity building we are engaged in to support Philippinex students and our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander students. Huge win for our region. And lastly, want to say too, to please save the date, October 22nd, please join Filipino, Filipinex, Filipina employees of Los Rios Community College for our first virtual Magkita Kits. It's a meetup. We're gonna talk topics and talk about how we can leverage Philam studies, how to support Anna PC work, and also uh, other work in our greater uh, Sacramento community. So Mabuhay Filipinex, Mabuhay Filipino American History Month, and Mabuhay CRC. And again, thank you so much for being here. I now turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Paolo Soriano, to introduce our remarkable keynote speaker. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Dr. Oliveros. Uh, mabuhay to everyone and, and magandang umaga sa inyo lahat. Um, I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing our keynote uh, speaker today. Uh, you already know her name, um, but I'll go ahead and, and give you a brief bio or as brief as it can be given all of her accomplishments and her achievements um, in, in, in making her the person and the scholar that she is today. Um, but uh, Dr. Robin Rodriguez is a full professor of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Davis. Uh, she was the first Panay to serve as chair in the Asian American Studies Department's 50 year history. She's also the founding director of the Bulasan Center for Filipino Studies, the only one of its kind in the University of California system and nationally focused on the Filipinx experience in the United States. Dr. Rodriguez earned her PhD in sociology at the University of California, Berkeley, one of the world's top ranked sociology departments. Her graduate studies were supported by the National Science Foundation and the Ford Foundation. After earning her doctorate, she was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship with the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at UC San Diego, and shortly thereafter, hired as assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Rutgers University. Dr. Rodriguez is a widely published and award-winning scholar, and she's written on global migration with a particular focus on overseas Filipino workers. She's written on Asian American, including Filipino American issues, highlighting Asian American activism in recent years. He's a highly sought after public speaker as evidenced today and has addressed a broad range of audiences around the world. In the last year, she, helped, she also helped lead the creation of the Sacramento Asian Pacific Islander Regional Network, uh, where they've successfully fought to ensure that the most marginalized of API communities in the region are getting the support they need to fight COVID-19 and to be protected from anti-Asian racism. Though she has achieved many firsts as a Filipina in her profession, she has been committed to ensuring that she will not be the last and mentorship and community building in academia, particularly for black indigenous women of color are of vital importance to her. So without further ado, Let's let's uh let's give Dr. Rodriguez a lit Los Rios and Sacramento welcome, y'all. Can I ask you all to unmute and just 
paw and, and just clap and just scream. So let's unmute ourselves. Like, woo! Yeah. 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 Thank you for being here. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much to everybody who helped put this together. Ooh, the welcome still keeps going. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much. It's so lovely to be here with all of you today. Uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Oliveros, for taking the lead on this. Paolo, uh, Sabrina, of course, uh, so many others who've been responsible. Angela, my uh, on our team, um, thank you so much for being here. So yay, happy Filipino American History Month 2021. <laughs> so let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, hopefully uh, this works in the way that I'm wanting it to work. Just give me a moment. Uh, good, good. So everybody sees that. Yes. Okay, cool. Now I just have to get my, um, my notes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why it like makes it a little hard. Okay, just give me a moment. Sorry. I'm not trying to get you to see my notes. Oh, Dr. Uh, Rodriguez, your slides disappeared. I know, I know. Okay. Just give me a sec. Let's try it again. Let me see. Okay. Do you see me now? Do you see the slides or do you see my notes? No notes, no slides currently. Okay, we shall try again. Okay. Does this work? Yes. Awesome, thank you so much. I didn't mean to go ahead, but it, ooh, it's going ahead, further ahead than I intended. So I just wanna start here. Are we, I just wanna make sure that, uh, are you seeing the first slide? Thank you. Right, so the title for today is A Century in the Making, the Unfolding History of Filipinos in the Sacramento Region. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I picked this particular title. Now, uh, for those of you who don't already know, October is in fact Filipino American History Month. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the, the theme for this year's Filipino American History Month is um, 50 years since the first Young Filipino People's Far West Convention. And as you see on this slide, in 1971, so 50 years ago, over 300 young Filipino American people gathered in Seattle for the first Young People's Far West Convention. And for 11 years, that's quite a bit of time, 11 years, youth participants met at the FWCs to discuss issues important to them from identity to the anti-martial law movement to farm workers' rights to ethnic studies. The FWCs are considered to be the beginnings of the Filipino American movement and the impetus for Filipino American studies. And so for this year, uh, Fawn, sorry, um, which is the major uh, Filipino organization that really does the work of preserving our history. The Filipino American National Historical Society is really encouraging the celebration of the, far, uh, of the Filipino People's Far West Convention and just of youth empowerment and organizing throughout Asian American history, uh, Filipino American history. Really, really important about why October. So Filipino American History Month is celebrated now in October because, and I'll talk about this, but it, it commemorates the arrival of the first Filipinos who landed in what is now Morro Bay in, on the central coast in California. Uh, and that happened in October eight, on October 18th, 1587, 1587. Um, and it's also the birth month of Filipino American le labor leader, Larry Itliong. And Larry Itliong um, is, was a leader alongside Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, as well as Filipino American labor leader, Philip Veracruz. And together they, they, they helped form the, the United Farm Workers. So uh, I really wanted to just make sure that, you know, people understand, you know, where is this coming from? And I also want to speak to, um, I'll, I'll weave this in, but what's really interesting is this Far West Convention was pretty significant even in the Sacramento region. Many of the important leaders 
here in Sacramento in the greater region uh, uh, were people, were young people attending the Filipino People's Far West Convention. Uh, some of the people who were responsible for, for forming uh, what became the FONS, right, the Filipino American National Historical Society's chapter in, in Sacramento and the Delta uh, attended these conferences. Other people who fought for uh, ethnic studies at Sac State, and that is the my Zoom background today is from Sac State. Uh, is a is a is an image of the mural that Filipino Americans had advocated for here in the region again to commemorate Filipino American history. So, you know, for those of you who uh, may not realize it, all around us, all throughout the Sacramento region, there are traces of of Filipino American history that may not always be uh, known to you, and hopefully with this this presentation and also with Elk Grove Unified uh, commemorating uh, or marking October as Filipino American History, History Month, we can really start to um, pay more attention to the rich uh, contributions Filipinos have made to this region for over a century. One of the things I want to talk about is this, the significance of calling it Filipino American History Month as opposed to Filipino American Heritage Month. And here I'm really drawing from my dear, dear friend and colleague, the late, we lost her far too early, the late Dr. Don Mabalon, who was a, um, who grew up in Stockton, California, and actually and, uh, went on to write the definitive uh, history of Filipino American Stockton. Uh, in her book, Little uh, Manila is in the Heart. So she says this, and this is from a post of hers in social media, um, on social media in 2013. And she makes this very clear. She says, it's not Heritage Month. It's not Philippine Heritage Month. Okay, thanks. This is from a post. And if you, partly I, I wanna be able to bring that energy for her because she was incredibly funny. For those of us who knew her, um, she was just so gregarious and just hilarious. And so I wish I could, I hope I'm channeling you, Dawn. <laughs> not Heritage Month. Okay, thanks. So history, she says, as is stated on this slide, history is inclusive of heritage and culture, but it's also about the ways we've built and changed this nation. Our stories, political struggles, transformations, labor migration, activism, impact of imperialism and war, victories, etc. Whereas heritage is more limited to what we pass down in terms of culture, tradition, legacies. History is inclusive, is inclusive of heritage and much more, whereas heritage isn't inclusive necessarily of history all the time. We made history, we helped build this nation. That's what this month is all about. And again, wanting to foreground that because uh, I, I have seen the ways in which people have uh, taken, I think, Filipino American History Month out of context or oftentimes kind of delimit it to a celebration of Philippine culture. It becomes a time when everybody's kind of, you know, celebrating Philippine dance, like the bamboo, you know, stick dance that some of you may know as Tindikling or celebrate eating adobo and pancit or lumpia. Those are things that are, are fantastic things. But um, really what we're trying to talk about here is, is history, right? All, inclusive of all the things that uh, Dr. Mabalan talks about here in this slide. But before I actually go into history um, uh, of the region, I actually want you to all to take a moment to reflect on your own family's migration to and settlement in the region. Uh, with the exception, of course, of Native peoples who have been caretakers on this land for far, far longer uh, than this country was a country, um, I really do want you to just take a quick moment. If you have to grab a, a, a a piece of paper and do this old school and, and a pencil, pencil and paper, or if you want to open up a, a, some notes, I really want you to take a moment to reflect about how you came to be here in this place or wherever it may be. But, you know, I'm assuming I'm talking to a lot of people who are kind of in the broad Sacramento region, but even wherever you may be, actually, take a moment to think about how did you come to be in the, the place that you are now. Um, I, I'm asking you to do this because I'm hoping that by you finding a connection, um, by, by you really reflecting on your, uh, your particular migration story, your settlement story, that somehow you might be able to find a connection between uh, your story and this broader uh, history that I'll, I'll paint for you today. I think 
part of why I invite you to do this is because we do live in a society that is so about the present. Uh, I, I had a colleague call it a presentist society, right? Everything is about uh, uh, instantaneous news. Um, you know, we have Instagram. It's not histogram, it's Instagram. It's the now. Um, history sometimes is only as far as a Google search may yield right? Uh, you might have to click over 10 times before you can get into a deeper and richer history uh, and get stories uh, beyond the scope of what kind of pops up in a particular search or, or um, kind of our feed. So I really want to invite you to take a moment to reflect on your migration and settlement story of your family uh, so that you can find a way to connect to this broader history, because I think that these stories are so valuable to connect with, to value and to cherish. So just take a moment to, to do that um, and just reflect. I'll give you about you know, a minute or so to just think about uh, how you came to be here. And then as we talk and I share with you uh, the Filipino American history of the region, hopefully you can uh, see yourself somehow in relation to it, even if you don't necessarily have roots in the Philippines or connect kind of with that identity. I'll just take a moment. If you feel so compelled, you could even share it in the chat. Hopefully we'd share the chat, we can save the chat transcripts later, but just take a moment again. What is your story, your history? Okay, let me just, let's go. Uh, let, oh, it doesn't seem like anybody's here, but that's okay. Ah, thank you, J uh, Janice, I appreciate that. Um, but you know, as you continue to reflect, just keep it in the back of your mind. I'm gonna bring Dawn in again. Dawn was so insightful. One of the things she said is this, we have lost much of our community history because of the assumption that our past is not history, that it is not an American experience worthy of interpretation. An analysis to some people, newspapers, community programs, photo albums, and documents, etc., were only junk, or at best, someone else's memories rather than history. It's a, a really, really important quote for Dr. Uh, Mabalan because uh, she really, really uh, tried to, to in her work really bring all of these things, the things that we might think of as junk someone's memories, bring them together and, and, and together weaving all of these stories together, creating the, the, the history of, of Filipino America. In her case, Filipinos in Stockton, but her, her book really um, shed light on the Filipino American historical experience in the broader region. And why I title this talk as history in the making and that it's unfolding is because we continue to need to do the work of sharing our stories. And that's actually what, what we've been doing at uh, the Welga Archive. And today I'm actually drawing uh, quite a bit from all of the stories we've been able to preserve on the Welga Archive that's housed at the, the Belusan Center. And, and I do wanna note, you know, for those of you uh, who are really, who haven't yet had a chance to, to share your story, uh, in Elk Grove, we are going to be celebrating Filipino American History Month on the 22nd. Hopefully we'll be able to send details to those of you uh, who have an interest in participating, but we wanna be able to do like a story share booth over there. So please share your story. But that's what we've been doing at the Welga Archive. I'll give you a quick, quick uh, history of the Welga Archive. So in 2013, uh, Assembly Member Rob Bonta, now Attorney General Ma Rob Bonta, um, introduced the assembly bill AB 123. And the bill basically did as, uh, as, as is explained by assembly member Bonta in this slide, 
what he did or what the bill did was was to supplement California's rich farm worker history with the contributions of Filipino American uh, of the Filipino American community. The Filipino American population is comp population composes the largest Asian population in California and continues to grow. Yet the story of Filipinos and their crucial efforts to the farm labor movement is an untold part of California history. Of course, the image that you have um, uh, also on the slide, in addition to uh, assembly then assembly member Bonta uh, testifying in support of AB 123 and he's accompanied by Dolores Huerta who is uh, probably better known uh, as a labor leader of the United Farm Workers Movement or the Farm Workers Movement um, and, and they were there to support the passage of this law that really uh, mandates that now in the teaching of the farm worker history in, in California's public schools, that at least the contributions of the Filipino American community also be part of it, which includes the story of, of Larry Itliong. So we created the Welga archive because the, the sad truth, and it was really, really, really uh, tragic that we lost Dr. Don Mabalan. The sad truth is though it's been over 50 years, the Filipinos had actually been incredibly active in organizing farm workers practically since the time they landed in the 1930s to work in the fields throughout the Delta, throughout this region, despite the, all of the work that they had done over decades, experience they brought into to the organizing in the 1960s that eventually led to the creation of the United Farm Workers for which Cesar Chavez is, is, is very well known as well as Dolores Huerta. Um, there have been countless books on the United Farm Workers, countless books on Cesar Chavez, but it, but uh, we have yet to see a scholarly text on Larry Itliong and his contribution. Dr. Don Mabalan was in the midst of writing that and finishing that when she died tragically in 2018. We're fortunately fortunate enough to have an illustrated book that she co-wrote with Gail Roma Santa, also a Stockton native, uh, which at least captures some of the research that Larry, uh, that that Don, uh, Dr. Mabalin was able to do. Um, but you know, part of uh, what's kind of the tragedy is that though uh, Assembly Member Bonta, again now Attorney Attorney General Bonta, was able to get this law passed, even though it's a mandate, we we have very little to draw from. If teachers wanted to teach. Uh, Filipino American contributions to the farm worker struggle. Uh, if, if we hadn't really done some of this work of trying to create this archive, which we did, they would be hard pressed to find books out there. And so what we did was to try to collect oral histories as fast as we could before people passed, to try to collect documents before people uh, chuck them into the recycling bin uh, to try as much as possible to recreate and get uh, kind of the, the material together to help support the writing of the histories of uh, Filipinos' contra uh, contributions to the farm worker struggle. So, you know, I think it was dropped in the chat, but, you know, if you're interested, you'll see that I'll, I'll talk a lot about some of the, the collections in our archive and draw from them. But I, I thought it was just important for everybody to kind of uh, just understand some of the backstory. Again, our history is unfolding. We still have a lot of work to do. Again, Larry Itliong and many, many other labor leaders did, did so much that has yet to be fully accounted for in books. Uh, there's still an unfolding history of contributions of Filipinos in, in the region even now. So. Without further ado, let me go into it. Uh, again, doc, drawing from Dr. Mabalon, um, one of our, uh, you know, really few Filipino American historians. So, although part of what we're also doing at the Bulusan Center is trying to mentor the next generation of Filipino American historians. But uh, Dr. Don Mabalon offered this really, really great framework for thinking about the Filipino immigration to the United States. And she uh, delineate, uh, delineates, or she identifies these seven major waves of Filipino immigration. And, um, and it encompasses more than a century of Filipino settlement in, in, in the US. Uh, I'll try to power through all of them because I still, I wanna be able to really anchor um, 
uh, or, or bring in the experiences of, of Filipinos in this region in particular when I when I go through each of the waves. But these are the seven waves of Filipino immigration that I really still feel that, that I feel are really, really great for helping us to think about um, Filipino migration broadly to the to the United States, also specifically to the region. So there's again these seven um, these seven periods. So the first is the seafarers, slaves, and shipbuilders, and that starts from 1587 to 19, uh, 1898. The second is war, imperialism, and the pensionado, 1898 to 1906. The third is cicadas and adventurers, 1906 to 1934. Uh, the fourth is exclusion, the exclusion period, war and the second generation, 1934 to 1946. Post-war changes and Navy families, that's the fifth uh, wave, 1946 to 1965. Uh, the sixth wave is post-65 immigrants, 1965 to 1986, and the seventh, which is Filipinos in the diaspora, 1986 to the present. So hopefully folks did the little uh, or accepted my invitation to take pause and think about their own family's migration and settlement, uh, whatever it may be, whether your roots are in the Philippines or elsewhere. And perhaps you can already begin to map your own migration story against this historical timeline to think uh, if you're not Filipino, what your connection or your family, uh, family's connection might be to the Filipino American experience. And if you are Filipino, to, to be able to map your personal experience onto the collective experience of our community as a whole in the United States and in the region. Uh, before though, I go on into each of these periods of time, it's really important to have an analytic framework for thinking about uh, when, why, when, why, and how Filipinos uh, migrated and settled in the country, right? Uh, I don't want you to just kind of to, to, to throw out a whole string of facts that um, are that you don't are, you're not able to frame more uh, within a with a within a kind of um, a, a framework that at least I think is important within a, a critical ethnic studies lens, which is what I bring to the table whenever I teach the Filipinx or Filipino experience in America. Um, it's really, really important to, to, to understand and place Filipinos migration within the broader context of the United States imperatives as a racial capitalist country. Uh, I draw very much from black studies scholars here uh, in their uh, definitions of racial capitalism or the, their definitions of the US as a racial capitalist society. Black studies scholar Robin Kelly says that uh, racial capitalism is a system dependent on slavery, on violence, imperialism, and genocide. And, you know, again, we cannot understand Filipinos' migration if we cannot place it within the context of the fact that the US is a racial capitalist uh, society. And, you know, uh, as I've, I mentioned earlier, I don't want us to just uh, look at these various facts without having a framework for, for making sense of their various historical facts uh, that, that you'll encounter over the course of this presentation. Uh, so let's just move on just to understand uh, early, 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 early Filipino migration. You have to understand uh, the United States development as a settler colonial. And when we say settler colonial, it is about uh, the fact that that, that what we now occupy, and we started this presentation with a land acknowledgement, thankfully that's something that people are doing in very recent years now, but we know that the land on which we sit here uh, was, was land is continuous in many cases because it's you know, contested in some places, but continues to be um, connected to native peoples, that the native peoples were forcibly displaced as a consequence of white uh, uh, settler colonialism. Racial capitalist society, this racial capitalist society in America required the dispossession and genocide of native peoples. It required blacks labor first as enslaved workers or enslaved laborers and then as poorly paid workers. And then later the United States would turn to other sources of labor, especially after uh, the post civil uh, war period. And this is sort of a classic image that uh, is depicted of uh, Chinese laborers who were among the first laborers from Asia who were actively recruited 
to, to work in the United States. Um, and you know, for those of you who are in the region, there's a bit of their history in the railroad museum and the train museum in Sacramento. Um, but to understand why the Chinese, you kind of, again, have to understand it within the context too of, of the post-emancipation period or after the Civil War. So after the Civil War, it meant that the United States could not depend anymore on uh, enslaved labor, right? By then the Civil War ended uh, so, uh, slavery formally in, in the United States. And so among the things that, that uh, employers did was try to uh, source other forms of cheap laborers uh, to fulfill certain kinds of uh, labor demands and employers look to Asia first for workers. Hence, uh, you see Chinese workers being among the first workers being recruited to work in the United States, especially after the post-Civil War period. And so for those of you who are, you know, who might be rusty with your history, so the Civil War um, ended uh, in 1865. So just knowing that kind of this is where the beginnings of Asian migration happen is in the, the period after that in the late 19th century and Filipino migration comes um, along with uh, or after uh, different sources of labor uh, come in from the from other parts of, of Asia. And, and I'll explain a little bit to you as to why um, the US uh, went from different countries, went across different countries of Asia for, uh, for workers. One of the things about US immigration policy is it's always been shaped by this paradox or this kind of contradiction. So of racial capitalist demand on one hand, but also very white supremacist ideas related to, to labor competition and citizenship. Another way I like to think about it is they wanted Asians as workers, but did not want them as people to settle and live in the country. Right? Only wanted them as workers and their labor, but ultimately did not want them as people who could settle and, and, and be here. And this was um, uh, especially true, of course, we could see the remnants until today of anti-Asian hate and discrimination even now. Well, some of the origins of that uh, can, you could trace all the way back to the, to the late um, 19th century. But, but so the, the US immigration always had this kind of paradox, right? Labor demand on one hand, and yet this pushback um, against uh, racialized workers. And so um, though after the Civil War, the United States uh, employers, US employers were really trying to find other sources of cheap labor, they went to China, and yet there was then a pushback against uh, Chinese uh, immigration. And so after the Chinese, uh, with all the pushback and anti-Asian or anti-Chinese sentiment that then led to laws restricting Chinese immigration, and then the US went to then recruit from Japan. The Japanese workers uh, would also then be uh, targeted by anti-Asian sentiment and sometimes even violence. That then also led to anti-Japanese or anti-Japanese immigration exclusion. And then eventually then they turned to, uh, to uh, the Philippines as I'll explain in a bit. But so the anti-Asian uh, sentiment, um, really what that is, is the negative attributes that are often ascribed to those who are racialized non-white, uh, which combine them to a low wage, low status work. The, there was this whole yellow peril stereotype that emerged. You could see it in all these images, like this kind of menacing figure of what's supposed to be uh, a Chinese worker. This is the kind of stereotype that was, uh, that was kind of propagated and uh, reproduced in the late 19th century, not unlike, of course, the kind of anti-Asian sentiment that was also propagated with the rise of COVID, with notions of the Wuhan flu. Um, white supremacist nativist forces often called for the end of different kinds of um, migration of different Asian workers. And just to kind of recap some of the laws that were instituted um, is, it, you know, first you see some of the recruitment of um, Asian workers coming in to complete the transnational, transcontinental railroad within years after the end of the civil war then uh, you start to see successive acts um, prohibiting the migration of Asians. First was the 1875 uh, Page Law, which actually prohibited the migration of Asian women, uh, specifically Chinese women, uh, because that was uh, what was, my, the women were migrating from China in the main at the time. 
Then there was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, and then the Gentlemen's Agreement, which stopped Japanese migration in 1907. Really interesting, I don't know, not so fun fact, but McClatchy, V.S. McClatchy, if you're all familiar with the Sacramento Bee newspaper, uh, V.S. McClatchy, uh, the owner of the Sacramento Bee, a newspaper publisher, was among the very active anti-Asian activists uh, during this time in the late 19, in the late 19th century. Uh, he became a very leading figure leading uh, the uh, efforts to stop uh, Asian migration uh, from China and then from um, Japan. Uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, kind of rehash this broader context, really, again, uh, trying to place all of the different seven periods of Filipino uh, migration to the United States within this broader context of this framework of racial capitalism. I do invite you, there's a really, really great uh, uh, timeline uh, that was produced by a uh, partnership between Asian American studies scholars and Asian American a uh, advocates called a different Asian American timeline. And it's been added in the chat. Thank you, Angela, my assistant is, who has been sharing it in the chat. Fantastic resource, because uh, if you want to revisit later some of the, se the seven periods of time that I talk about here, but then really look at it in connection to other communities of color, in connection to settler colonialism that's ongoing and the dispossession and genocide of native peoples that's all also happening in the backdrop of Filipino migration to right, the continued struggles of black people in America to uh, other connections to Latinx and, you know, um, uh, uh, communities, you can see all of that uh, really nicely laid out in this timeline because I'm not going to be able to do that fully here. But again, it's not sufficient to just know a bunch of facts like, yay, Filipinos landed in Morro Bay in this year or Filipinos are, you know, numerous in this uh, place for, you know, these facts are, are, are not meaningful if we can't also provide a frame for them. And again, for me, at least, the frame has to be one rooted in a critical ethnic studies lens, which means necessarily that you have to look at Filipino migration uh, from the framework of racial capitalism uh, in the United States. So let's begin with the waves. Uh, we're already so deep into this conversation and I haven't even gone to the first wave, but the first wave was 1587 to 1898, uh, the seafarers, uh, slaves and, and shipbuilders. So for those who don't know, that's why my last name, by the way, is Rodriguez, in case you were confused, <laughs> a Spanish last name uh, for a person who looks like me because the Philippines had been colonized by the Spanish for several centuries. Um, but uh, prior to the colonization of the Philippines in uh, 1565, the peoples of the archipelago were very varied in history and culture and weren't really with a, uh, were without a central government. But uh, the beginnings of Filipino uh, global migration and their presence in North or what we're now calling North America is connected to this history of col uh, colonization. So the, the Spanish galleon trade across the Pacific depended on labor, of course. They depended on seafarers, depended on, on shipbuilders, even on slaves. There's actually more recent historical studies that have shed more light on the trans-Pacific slave trade, as, as many people are more familiar perhaps with the transatlantic slave trade, but there was in fact also a trans-Pacific slave trade. Um, and so the presence of Filipinos in the very beginning of that first wave is um, attributed to the, the to uh, Spanish co uh, colonialism. Uh, the first notable uh, landing uh, of Filipinos was on the shores of what is now called Morro Bay in 15, 16, 1587. They were crew members aboard a galleon ship, uh, jumped ship and decided, uh, well, in this case, they landed um, there. And so just their presence uh, was at this time. If you go to Morro Bay, you'll see a plaque there that the Filipino American National Historical Society was able to get installed there. There's actually another notable settlement of Filipinos uh, that is documented that's fairly early and that's in Louisiana in 1763 in a place called St. Malo. They too had arrived by um, on Spanish uh, ships uh, most accounts suggest that they were laboring on Spanish trading vessels when they decided to settle 
in, of course, what is now the United States. There's a, evidence that suggests that they intermarried with Native women, uh, with Black women as well in Louisiana. What's uh, really, really interesting is there's actually a group uh, in Louisiana of Filipinos who descend from, from these earlier migrants who continue to preserve the history of the settlement there. Unfortunately, climate change linked to really the destructive nature too of the oil industry in, in Louisiana has nearly wiped St. Malo from existence, but there are people doing the work of preserving that history. Uh, the United States replaced the Spanish colonizers after they defeated the Philippine independence movement. So the Filipinos were actually in a very successful uh, revolutionary uh, movement against the Spanish. I I'm always very proud to say I am a descendant of a Filipino anti-colonial revolutionaries. Uh, it's in our blood. Uh, we were very successful uh, at at uh, at uh, at uh, throwing off uh, the yoke of Spanish colonialism. Uh, we thought that Americans or Filipinos thought that the, the Americans might be allies in their fight against the Spanish because the United States has its own anti-colonial history in its fight for independence from the Britain. Uh, Filipino revolutionaries learned quickly that uh, what they thought was an ally was in fact just a new colonizer. And so the United States did become um, the uh, uh, colonized the Philippines in, in, in 1898. And, and, and uh, you know, colonization in the Philippines was incredibly brutal. Again, the Filipinos uh, had been fighting successfully first against Spanish colonization. And when they, when they realized that the United States was going to, to move in to replace the Spanish as colonizers were fought, fought pretty bravely and uh, valiantly also against Spanish uh, colonization. And that really, really, I'm sorry, against American colonization. As with any kind of war, uh, the, the Philippines had been at war for many years by, by then, by the time the Americans had come in, it was incredibly devastating uh, on the Filipino people. And, and that became, um, that then uh, serves as the backdrop for why we then have massive uh, migration from the Philippines um, in in starting in the in the early 1900s into uh, uh, the 1930s. So let me just draw from a quote from Carlos Bolosan. So Carlos Bolosan, this is I highly recommend this book. America is in the heart. Totally transformed my life. Writer Carlos Bolosan, after whom the center that we founded at UC Davis is named, uh, was a writer. He was also a migrant worker. He was writing, uh, he wrote this novel in the 1940s. Uh, really, really changed my own life. And, and America's in the Heart, it's a, no, it's a novel. So it's, it's a fictionalized account, but very, very much rooted in the actual experiences of Filipino migrants in the early decades of the 20th century. We named our center after him because we wanna do what he did, which is, to use uh, our research and our writing as a way of, of uplifting the most marginalized in our communities, uh, which he did. Uh, and I just wanna read from the novel because I think it's, it's helpful for understanding what was happening in the Philippines such that there was such pressure to come to the United States in the early parts of the 20th century. So uh, he writes this, on page 23 of his novel, we had no more land except the narrow strip of ground where our hut stood and the lot where our hut stood and the lot where my father had built a house for my brother Leon and his wife. And, we, and you know, it's kind of out of context, but in the novel, he really talks about how uh, the land holdings of his family is just kind of reduced significantly over time and that really putting pressure on his family. Um, he also, uh, just discusses the kind of wealth that's happening um, with the colonization of the Philippines by the Americans. Uh, the wealth that was not already in the power of the large corporations bank, banks and the church was beginning to flow in the vaults of new corporations, banks and other groups. As bloodily as this wealth concentrated into the hands of new companies, as swiftly did the peasants and workers become poorer. Again, you know, he really captures what is shifting um, 
and, and kind of made worse and exacerbated by the colonization of the, uh, of the Philippines by the United States after Spanish colonization. Just he describes this episode of his, his uh, father trying to seek justice at the court. And, and he describes it this way, he had no money and the wise men at the spoke uh, at the court spoke to him in Spanish and English, what could a poor ignorant peasant like my father do in an organization such as the provincial government, uh, government of Pangasinan? You know, so these kind of episodes are really, really uh, important uh, for, I think these episodes from the novel, I think provide really, really great, rich description of what it felt like for Filipinos during the American colonial experience why then that created some of the displacement um, that would later lead to mass migration. And arguably, so many of these episodes, right, that he's writing about in 1946, that formed the backdrop of early migration of Filipinos to the United States in the early 20th century can still be, um, is still a reason for why Filipinos still feel compelled to migrate today. So later on, I'll, I'll talk about there's some youth that are doing a, a, a intensive um, a discussion of kind of Philippine history and the, the long lasting legacies of, of, of imperialism and colonialism in the Philippines to this day, this weekend, uh, or in a couple of weekends, I'll share that later. But, you know, Again, as Belusan describes in his novel, those who survived the American War, the Philam War, were often left with very little land uh, and consequently little food, without livestock, without homes, barely without with homes. And this is the kind of condition that then, uh, when when they were later given the opportunity to do so, that Filipinos would migrate for the Philippines from the Philippines to the U.S. for employment. Because, of course, on the other side of the Pacific, here in the United States and in its territory in Hawaii, again, right, just going back to that initial conversation I had with all of you about the broader context of racial capitalism in, in the United States, the, the U.S. economy uh, was growing, right? The Civil War had concluded, the transnational, uh, transcontinental railroad had been completed. The, the, the country was united in a new kind of way. The economy was booming. Um, it was really poised to be a global power now. Uh, in fact, it not only colonized the Philippines and the Pacific, but also colonized uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico in the, in the Atlantic. So really the United States is, is kind of um, uh, emerging as a kind of global power. And there, that, that requires new kinds of uh, demand for labor, at least in agriculture. Again, as I talked about, you know, the US first went to China for rec recruiting workers. There was an anti-Chinese push, which led to their exclusion. They then went to Japan and there was an anti-Japanese push well, then the Philippines became a third major potential source for workers and an incredibly convenient source, because in the case of the Philippines, the Philippines was now a colony of, of, of the United States. So technically, the U.S. had jurisdiction over the Philippines. The Philippines wasn't supposed, you know, a foreign country. It was kind of, you know, uh, an extension, um, if you will, of the United States. Uh, the, the U.S. didn't want to give Filipino citizenship. Uh, because, you know, even though uh, the U.S. had colonized the Philippines, they couldn't quite extend citizenship to Filipinos in the Philippines, but they said, oh, those, there are nationals. And so they kind of still um, belong and are connected to us. And it's because of Philippine status as nationals that they then were, were able to uh, be recruited fairly easily to the United States, despite some of these other kind of um, exclusions. So what happened? Well, first, uh, the U.S. first, after really brutally suppressing uh, the Philippine-American War, really brutally suppressing the Philippines' uh, uh, anti-colonial movement against the United States, it then introduced this policy of so-called benevolent assimilation. So it's like, you know, uh, really, really ensured that uh, the, the resistance was dead. And then in its place, then started to introduce a bunch of uh, measures uh, to try to now win the hearts and minds of Filipinos. Uh, and, and so what they did was they expanded publication, uh, I'm sorry, expanded public education in the Philippines. And among the things that it also did is that it, it took elite uh, members of elite family families in the Philippines and, and decided to 
bring them over to the United States to give them an American style education. These people were called pensionados, mainly men, although there were some women as well. The idea was the elites, the elite families of the Philippines, if they could have their hearts and minds won over, if they're trained in American ways, they could be um, helpful in, in the United States uh, colonization of the Philippines, right? So they're kind of putting a brown face to American colonization in the Philippines. And that's really the beginnings of Filipino migration here. In these early, the first kind of decade of the 20th century was of these pensionados. But soon enough, um, you know, word went back, Filipinos kind of hearing that, oh, there might be educational opportunities um, in, in the United States. And so others would try to make their way to the US uh, for schooling, but they weren't necessarily sponsored by the government. And so you see here in 1903, there's initially this, this first, you know, um, 100 who were brought in and were sponsored. And then by 1910 to 1938, we've got up to 14,000 who now are kind of coming on, on their own. Uh, and again, that's kind of the, that constitutes, sorry, that the, the initial second wave of Filipino migration. The third major wave, and that's probably the most significant wave uh, for really the settlement of Filipinos, the migration and settlement of Filipinos here in the region, in the greater Sacramento region, is this wave, uh, the, the 1906 to 1934 wave of the Sakadas and the adventures, uh, uh, according, using again, Dr. Mabalon's uh, timeline. So in terms of work, uh, you see uh, in 1906 is the beginnings of the recruitment of workers first in Hawaii, in, a, in the United States territory of Hawaii. Um, these workers were called sakadas and they were really brought in to work in Hawaii's uh, sugar industry. If you were paying attention before, and when I was talking about the anti-Asian exclusion laws, you might remember that there was the 1907 Gentleman's Agreement, and that was the, 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 the agreement that led to the end of a Japanese uh, migration to the United States. Well, in anticipation that that was going to happen, um, the, uh, the planters in Hawaii, sugar plantation owners, kind of knew that something could be on the horizon and that might limit their, their importation of Japanese workers. Uh, so, you know, again, if those of you, everybody seems to be going to Hawaii lately. Um, I've been seeing all these posts, but if you're always surprised, like, whoa, there's so many Asians here in Hawaii, why are they here? Well, here's part of the history, right? That, that uh, the Japanese um, were among uh, the, the groups really brought in aggressively recruited to work in, in Hawaii. When the gentleman's agreement ended that, then the, the, the uh, Hawaiian planters, Sugar Planters Association went to the Philippines as a, again, a convenient source of workers because the Philippines is a colony, Filipinos were considered nationals. And then you see the beginnings of this migration to, to Hawaii uh, with um, nearly 30,000 arriving in Hawaii between 1907 to 1919, and then yet another kind of almost 30,000 coming in by 1920 and 1924. Um, through the 1920s, uh, many of the tens of thousands of, of, of Filipinos would migrate here into the, on the Pacific coast. Some of them would come by way of Hawaii. Some would come directly to, um, to California. Uh, most of these were very, very young men, usually under the age of 30, often with uh, very uh, little education. Uh, for those who... Uh, worked in the urban areas, who settled in the urban areas. They often worked in restaurants, hotels, in private homes as low-wage service workers. Um, in rural areas, they were workers, um, they were migrant workers or seasonal workers. So they basically migrated to where the jobs were from um, all across the state of California and even sometimes all the way up to work in the salmon uh, canneries in Alaska. Uh, by the 1930s, by 1930, there were about 30,000 Filipinos in California already. Excuse me, 10,000 of them uh, were in Stockton because it was a major agricultural center. Um, and then the rest of the Filipino population was sort of spread out throughout here in the Delta. Uh, Ryer Island, Rio Vista, Lock, Isleton, uh, Walnut Grove, uh, even Elk Grove. So I invite you, for those of you who are CRC students, 
uh, you know, it's not that far from you to kind of go over and 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 get really close to go to these towns. But you know, this is where uh, early Filipino migrants uh, had settled. Um, all throughout the, the Delta region. So I wanna just kind of read this, uh, this real quick excerpt from um, one of the papers that's in our Welga archive that kind of describes what, what life was like for these young Filipino uh, men who were coming and migrating and settling uh, here in the region. In the 1920s, a one-way one fare in the steerage section cost approximately $100. And that was about all that Pinoy's could afford. Visiting exotic ports like Hong Kong, Shanghai, Kobe, and Yokohama added excitement to their voyage. But fear set in when contagious diseases spread through the boat. Often the steerage section had the heaviest toll. Pneumonia and meningitis were two common uh, diseases that affected the Filipino travelers. Um, they would often arrive in San Francisco and be quarantined in Angel Island. And, um, you know, once uh, Pinoy landed, of course, their first objective was to try to uh, first see the big city. So they would kind of go and hang out in San Francisco. And then eventually they would make their way to Sacramento, taking um, a train a train, or even the Filipino. Apparently, there were these Filipino taxi cabs that kind of took them from San Francisco to Sacramento and then even uh, to Stockton. What a lot of the men were doing here um, was they were working as asparagus cutters. And then after the harvest, they often had went to asparagus canneries. Again, some of these remnant, remnants, you can still see some of the old factories around the Delta if you go there. Asparagus had been introduced to the, to the region in 1894. Um, and then so, you know, all these kind of factories or these, uh, these canneries are, were erected too. I mean, you have to remember, right? For those of you, you know, who, who, who may not realize this, right, refrigeration only gets introduced later. So at this time, the reason why there were so many canneries is because, you know, you couldn't always eat fresh vegetables, but vegetables needed to kind of be canned. And so that's why the workers would kind of go from um, picking vegetables, in this case here, around here, vegetable asparagus, then they would go to, to uh, the canneries. But, you know, if you understand crop cycles, right? Um, once you're done harvesting, well, first of all, all across California, the, the harvest is different for different types of fruits and vegetables uh, because, you know, the weather is different across the state. And so people would kind of migrate, depend, you know, from farm to farm, from crop to crop, all the way up uh, California. And so oftentimes they lived in these camps. They lived in these temporary shelters, and these shelters were all around um, in San Joaquin, Sacramento, Solano, Sutter, Yolo County, and even Contra Costa County. Uh, all around these counties, there was almost 400 farm labor um, housing camps. Of course, we still are an agricultural state. Agricultural state. You know, let's not pretend, let's you know, not forget that there continue to be people who do this work. Uh, 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 for the in the main, we know uh, a lot of Mexican workers are doing this work. But um, in the recent research I've been doing with the Welga project, we, we, we are talking to Filipinos who are still doing migrant worker, just like this, farm labor, just like this um, in the Central Valley. And I'll talk, uh, there's a big event actually later on this month that I would invite uh, some of you guys to attend so that you can kind of see what's happening there. So, you know, this is kind of in the main what really brought a lot of Filipinos to this area. A lot of Filipinos also came uh, through the colonial period because of the U.S. Uh, Navy. The U.S. Navy recruited Filipino workers as stewards and mess boys. I think I saw in the chat somebody talking about having a, uh, a military connection. Not, not uncommon for many of us in the Filipino community because of the colonial relationship, right? Um, again, I just reminding you, right, there's this all this this dynamic to um, um, lab, uh, immigration policy in the United States. So on one hand, there's sort of demand for racialized workers, and then there's been this pushback. And Filipinos certainly experienced a lot of pushback. Um, you know, I always say that, you know, uh, it, it was frightening to live as a Filipino in 1930, in 1930s California, as, uh, as um, Carlos Belusan said, you know, I came to know afterward. In many ways, it was a it was a crime to be a Filipino in California. That's how how much uh, vitriol and violence Filipinos had to deal with. 
1930, of course, is the year after the Great Depression. So that's also partly what's kind of pushing back on, on kind of anti-Filipino sentiment. I'm not going to be able to kind of talk about it at length, but you know, um, I want to share a really great mini, uh, a short documentary that uh, our filmmaker connected to the uh, to the Belusan Center. Glenn Aquino did, it's a, a, a five minute um, short about anti an anti-Filipino riot that happened in Exeter, California. It's in the chat for you to be able to look at at some other uh, time. And again, just interesting notes about local leaders and what they did. You know, again, speaking about McClatchy. Um, McClatchy, uh, again, uh, the owner of the Sacramento Bee actually helped the Sacramento City Council. Sac City Council adopted a resolution supporting Filipino exclusion. Um, other different kinds of organizations are really active in, 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 in fighting for, uh, for um, anti-Filipino exclusion. There are lots of reasons for uh, the, the anti-Filipino uh, sentiment. Obviously there was the anti-Asian sentiment that was already out there. Uh, Filipinos uh, seem to attract especially kind of violent, the ire of, 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 uh, of many white supremacists because, you know, because Filipinos uh, knew some English, were somewhat uh, uh, cognizant of kind of Filip uh, of American culture because they had been colonized by the Americans and had been introduced to, to you know, American culture and education and could interact with white women, did interact with white women because there weren't as many Filipinas at the time that also kind of, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, incited some of this pushback against Filipinos. Um, oops, oops, I'm not gonna show this, sorry. Although it's a really cool um, uh, documentary to watch. Uh, once uh, the exclusion of Filipinos was successful in 1934, there was actually an, a campaign to expel Filipinos. So they, the, the, the federal government actually set aside money and they were trying to basically you know, pay Filipinos off to leave. It wasn't very successful, but uh, you know, there was an actual a, a attempt to expel Filipinos actively by 1935. Um, and that was with the Repatriation Act of 1935. You know, Filipinos, though, uh, though they were really, really um, uh, exploited on the fields, they were also organizing. And Filipino organizing in the fields pretty much started as soon as they started working on the fields. Uh, Filipinos organizing together. Um, often uh, across ethnic groups, which is already important because so many of them didn't always think of themselves as uh, as Filipinos because um, uh, so many Filipinos had very, very strong regional identities. And yet there is a way that they would come across ethnic lines on the field, in the fields. They would also then uh, unite with other uh, Asian ethnic groups and they fought pretty um, militantly uh, as workers in the fields. They were able to... to to, uh, to gain wage increases um, and, and some other kind of rights. Really big uh, strike that happened uh, in, in, in the area by the 1940s was the asparagus strike of Stockton led by the ILWU, uh, Local 37. Uh, really, really important uh, moment um, of Filipinos kind of coming together. And that this becomes some of the backdrop too for why you have, um, Larry, in fact, Larry Itliong was a, was a leader in this strike. This is where, where Larry Itliong really starts to learn uh, how to be an organizer in 1948, such that almost 20 years later in 1965 in Delano, uh, when he meets Cesar Chavez, he brings all of that, that, that labor organizing experience with him and they're able to successfully go on strike um, together with Mexican farm workers later on um, in the 1960s. There were uh, laws, though, prohibiting um, the, in, the the coupling of Filipino uh, Filipinos and, and and white women. There were what are called anti miscegenation laws. It was illegal for Filipinos to marry white women in California. But you know, it's been great. We've been collecting stories of Filipinos, uh, 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 third generation Filipinos here. In fact, one of the people who helped to get. The Filipino American um, History Month resolution passed by the Elk Road Unified School District. Uh, he um, actually, his grandparents were uh, a Filipino man and a white woman who had to go out of state to get married. Then they ended up coming back here and, and settling and having a family. And so, um, you know, 
Despite the laws prohibiting it, Filipinos did try to create families with white women, with native women, with black women, which is why you have kind of third generation Filipinos who are of mixed race. Uh, Sacramento, um, again, you know, I'm watching the time here. Gosh, so many stories to tell, but Sacramento had a thriving little Filipino town. Um, there were Filipino businesses in downtown Sac um, you know, that are, are, have since gone, but you know, there's a real uh, history there that, that's really uh, significant of Filipinos, not just you know, kind of working in the fields, but even opening up businesses in, um, in uh, Sacramento. Uh, here's a really great photo of downtown um, uh, Little Manila and Stockton. Um, I haven't yet been able to find any photos of the little Filipino town in Sacramento. If any of you have them in your homes, look under your beds and your closets and the storage units, please contribute them to the archives so we can reconstruct this history. Uh, there was a Filipino Federation of America. Look, uh, there was a chapter that was established here in, in, in the Sacramento region in the 1920s. The Filipino community of Sacramento and vicinity was actually established in 1929 here in, in Sacramento. It's still going strong. We'll, be, we'll actually be celebrating its um, Filipino American History Month activities on October 16th. So there was also a fourth wave of Filipino migrants. Um, by 1934, uh, the anti-Filipino sentiment was very successful, as I, I explained. Uh, Filipinos were excluded, but there was um, some people who were able to come to the United States in that period uh, be, during the war. Uh, during the war, uh, not too long after the, the you know, Filipinos were not just excluded, but they were try there was a, a process to try to expel them. During the war, all of a sudden the views towards Filipinos shifted a little bit. The, uh, the Japanese had occupied uh, the Philippines. Filipinos were joining in the anti-Japanese um, occupation uh, movement. Uh, many Filipinos here uh, joined the military. Uh, so things shifted a bit. People, people we talked to uh, from the region, local leaders like Dick Maison or Jay Pollard. These are people who are important figures now in the Filipino community um, who kind of, uh, some of them have these connections to the military having come through uh, the military, through their, uh, through their parents. Um, again, I'm just noticing the time I get so caught up in these stories that <laughs> I, 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 I miss out on time. There was a, a, a kind of fifth wave in 1946 after the war. Um, you had Filipino uh, elder or Filipinos who had been working in the fields and when they kind of got enlisted in the military, they went to the Philippines and went to find wives. And um, they were able to bring back uh, their wives and settle in the Sacramento region. Again, you know, so many institutions were established. There's still the American Legion, I think is in the next slide you'll see here. Uh, I'm not I'm gonna kind of go through that uh, quickly, but um, there is, oh, I thought there was a slide here. Where did I put the American Legion? Sorry, guys. Oh, there, there it is. <laughs> so there was this, uh, it's still around. This is the American Legion Magellan Post of uh, 604 on Gerber Road. Um, but, you know, a lot of Filipinos had joined up in the military, um, did come back with their families. This was a fixture for Filipino American life. Uh, from the 1950s and actually even to today uh, as Filipino veterans gathered here in this hall and had lots of kind of important life events um, celebrated here. Um, I mentioned before just about kind of Filipinos and the, the fields and, and their, val their really kind of militant labor organizing efforts. Um, you know, this is uh, just a, an oral history from a, a half Filipina, half Mexican woman who also ended up becoming a labor organizer for the farm worker struggle who talks about the ways that Filipinos were often pitted against other ethnic groups. Yet by 1965, you know, you have the Delano grape strike and, and the coming together of Filipinos with Mexicans. Again, I'm not gonna be able to talk at length there. But a sixth wave is from 1965, um, to and on where you really have uh, the immigration laws changing. Uh, 1965 is when all of the racist exclusions in immigration law are dropped. And uh, when actually the United States starts to favor not just kind of low wage workers, but they really try to recruit um, professional workers, especially uh, professional workers in the STEM fields or health 
fields. Uh, my own migration story happens here. My mom is on here. I can see her. Hi, mom, <laughs> watching this. Um, her, my, she was a nurse and her migration um, at, was a consequence of the change of the 1965 Immigration Act. And it, it's also what explains a lot of the migration here. Um, some of the stories I could tell you just about what it was like here in the region. So a lot of Filipino nurses were recruited to work here in, in the area and in, in work in the, the hospitals in Sacramento. But some of them were settling in Stockton where there was a where it might have been more affordable and where there was a critical mass of Filipinos. Well, in the 60s and not in, and, and even recently, uh, Filipinos described stories of how um, of having to deal with really kind of anti-Filipino kind of racist sentiment coming through Elk Grove. Um, there's even a story of, uh, of the KKK being active here in the Elk Grove area and that there was a murder of a young, of a young Filipino girl. Their home was burned down by the KKK. Um, nobody ever investigated it. None of the authorities investigated it. Um, kind of still an unsolved mystery, but many the, the, the lore or just the stories among Filipinos is that it was in fact you know, connected to the KKK. So there was this whole real history uh, backdrop here of Filipinos also trying to survive in a place where there was a lot of continued hostility, a hostility that, 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 that really continued only until really the 2000s when things started to shift a little bit here um, in Elk Grove with new housing developments. I just wanna point out, you know, so many wonderful things that were happening kind of in the 60s by the now second and second generation. So some of the children of those migrants who had come from earlier decades were doing amazing things, whether, uh, you have pictures here. There's Albert Belinget. He was a UC Davis law student, uh, an activist uh, who fought for ethnic studies, who was among the people who helped create the department that hired me at Asian American Studies. Um, the reason why we have this beautiful mural is also linked to this earlier histories of people who were fighting for ethnic studies and Filipino studies. Uh, uh, the community was able to, to even uh, erect this center, the Jose Rizal Center. Um, there's a sad story there because it was the communities for a while jointly kind of managed with uh, the city government and soon enough uh, the, the the community um, wasn't able to continue to to have administrate to, to administer the center there's an ongoing um, struggle to build a new Filipino an autonomous Filipino center but there are all of these efforts in the community that led to institutions that we continue to benefit from even to this day. And there's the seventh kind of wave of migration, um, which is really from 1986 to the present. I have a really great picture here of Megan Sapiga, who is also a local Filipino American leader. Uh, her grandparents had come from from the Philippines to, to work in and settle here in the area. Her father was born here, born here in the 1950s, um, and and you know, but and was uh, married uh, her mother. And she grew up here as a biracial Pinay and also has lots of stories too about what it was like to grow up as a biracial Filipina in, in this area and, and how things have changed um, since she was born. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of just end off because we don't have too much time, but there's so much amazing work happening in the Filipino community um, in the last 20 years and even before of different organizations responding to, for instance, uh, Black Lives Matter and trying to show up and be in solidarity with the Black community. Also because our community is biracial. We have a lot of Filipino Black community members. There's all these organizations that are uh, that are working right now here in 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 the region. Hopefully uh, we see a revitalization too of the Filipino club at CRC. Um, just to kind of put it out there, if you want to learn more, you know, I, gosh, I can go into this for hours <laughs> as is clear today. But if you want to learn more, I am offering um, a free webinar series of a course that I'll actually be launching for the community and some of the links are there. Um, and I also want to just encourage, you know, I, I had a tragic loss last year of my, my son. Um, who died in the Philippines while working with Filipino indigenous uh, groups. This month as Filipino American History Month is supposed to be a celebration of youth organizers or youth activists, a motto in his life of 22 years. Uh, he took on many of the issues that were uh, meaningful to the people who convened the Far West Convention in 1971. He continued to fight for ethnic studies. He fought against gentrification. Um, and then uh, also fought about against rise, uh, rising tyranny in the Philippines, and then later ended up wanting to live and work with indigenous communities uh, where he ended up passing last year. So, you know, please uh, 
there's a way to kind of continue to learn about not just Filipino activism, but also the activism that was inspiring to him through that. But I don't have very much time. Oh, it's too many things to talk about. <laughs> it's five minutes only uh, for Q&A, but you know, perhaps hopefully I'll be able to see folks again. There's so many events I'm going to be at over the next uh, of the next few weeks. Um, please do. I think there's a there's a way to sign up for because you know we're still in the process there it is um so there's a couple of these events just to highlight there's even more i don't have all the flyers here but please uh stay updated because you know we just got uh again after over a century of being in the region elk grove unified school district and elk grove city council and i think the kasamnas uh district they're all going to all officially recognize philam history month so we have yet to announce everything that'll be happening um, in the town so please follow up with updates um you know again this is an unfolding history all of you have stories to tell that i hope we, you do tell please look at our, our, our website, the Blue Sun Center website. Um, there's a way to even submit your story to our Welga archive. But we don't have much time. But if you do have questions in the four minutes that we have, um, please ask them. If not, hopefully I get to encounter you again at any of these no numerous events or at future webinars that I'll be offering. But thank you, thank you. I hope I was able to bring alive this beautiful history. Um, oh yes, can you send out the links in a follow-up email? Yes, if I can maybe get the sign-in sheets or the, the registration from the CRC folks, I'd love to follow up with a list of, of things for everybody. Thank you, Ramel, who was my my date to the prom, <laughs> Deacon Ramel, when it's on blast, was my buddy in high school uh, when we were not living here, but living in the Bay Area. We had a great time, uh, both in leadership um, at the school. But again, if there's any questions, please, uh, please ask them. I hope it was, thank you for the affirmations. Hope it was informative, engaging. Um, really, really uh, excited to be able to answer any questions while we have them. But I think that you guys are supposed to close off, right? CRC team, sorry. Yes, we just want to thank oh, you sorry, and sorry. unmute and give a thank round of applause you. to you. Standing ovation, Dr. Rodriguez, thank you so much. Bravo, thank you for all of the comprehensive history and framework for understanding Philippinex American history, that framework around uh, colonialism and capitalism is so important for us as we think about too past, present, and future for our unfolding history of Philippinex in the greater Sacramento area. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. We will share out um, information, of course, with you, um, Dr. Rodriguez, but others that want the link to the recording. Um, so thank you, thank you again. Round of applause. Thank you to the events coordinator team. Thank you all for taking time out to be with us this morning and hearing this really remarkable and thought provoking presentation. We will also stay in touch with Dr. Rodriguez. So be on the lookout for more opportunities for us to engage with you and her as well. I'm so glad that your family's here. Um, Manang Daisy Rodriguez, so glad that you're here joining us this morning as well. Um, and you know, if there, I don't, we didn't see any questions in the chat, but you do know how to find Robin if you want to connect with her, Dr. Rodriguez, and take one of her classes, get her books, a booking if you want to come to future events. Um, there's lots of ways to engage in hoping that you'll also help revitalize the Kasamahan Philippinex student organization. So, yes, I hope to see that CRC <laughs> if we can support anything right yes we'll bring you back to maybe give a um talk or workshop with our students i think that would be really great don't you think paolo yeah <laughs> absolutely any any other closing thoughts paolo sabrina thoughts or if there are no gratitude for kicking us off our inaugural celebration and recognition especially at crc so so much so very grateful thank you dr rodriguez Yes, many thanks, many thanks over. Thank you. Yes, well, again, to everyone, a whole, a whole heartily maraming maraming salamat, Paul. We really appreciate you being with us this morning. And we'll stick around for a few minutes, but that really does conclude the formal part of our 
program and so delighted you could be with us for this historic moment for Cosumnes River College's Filipino community and community at large. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Hey, Robin, I just wanted to say hi.